Learning power is a concept that contains a whole lot of different ingredients, but it's all things that contribute to someone being able to engage with things that are difficult or challenging or disconcerting or unusual uh, in a way that is confident and calm and capable because I think that that's one of the most important things that we could help children develop when they're at school, which they will need in the 21st century. It's a confusing, busy, globalized, digitalized world, and they're going to have to be powerful learners for the rest of their lives. So we need to think, how can school help them build that set of attitudes and skills which will enable them to have that confidence as they go through the rest of their lives. I think what we need to do first in order to create the environment that, that cultivates these skills and attitudes is first of all we have to look at what's going on already in our schools, not immediately go and say we need a new program or we need a new initiative. In a lot of schools, when you stop to think about it, there are quite a lot of little practices going on that steer students in the direction of becoming more passive, more compliant, more concerned about the right answer, more afraid of making mistakes. In many classrooms, the culture invites implicitly but strongly invites those attitudes. Not, of course, not all children, not all students succumb to those invitations and those pressures. So the first thing is just to make sure that we're not teaching in a way that is encouraging that passivity. In English we talk about children who want to be spoon-fed in their education. Yeah, and you know, when we stop to think about it, now we become more clear, a lot of teachers are doing that. They don't mean to, they're not conscious of it, but they're creating that undertow, like in the ocean, that current that encourages children to be more passive and more compliant. So that's the first thing. So we have to take the brakes off. Then we can add some accelerators. Then we can add some techniques on the top like uh, the way we organize activities, the way we design activities in the classroom, the way we talk to children, the things that we notice about their own learning, about their behavior as learners. And if we then start to add up all these little ingredients, they create a culture that just makes it irresistible for young people to take more responsibility for their own learning, to not be frightened of difficulty, to learn to be more independent, to take charge. So it's like I, I often think of a parent whose, whose child, you know, like you have a two-year-old and she's struggling to do something and you go and you say, oh, what are you trying to do, sweetheart? You know, let me help you. And the children often say, no, mummy, me do it. There is that sense of wanting to be powerful, wanting to be independent. And somewhere along the line, many children lose that me do it attitude. And the learning power approach is all about how do we give them back and add strength to that attitude, which is they're going to need for the rest of their lives. It's interesting that what applies to the teacher in the classroom also applies to the school as a whole. There are some schools where the teachers have become passive and compliant and frightened of making mistakes or that they feel that if they have a little bit of noise in the classroom that someone will judge them, will say, you know, you, you don't have good control, you don't have good discipline in your classroom. So we also need to make sure that the leaders in schools understand that they too are in the business of creating this culture, that teachers need to be empowered to be more imaginative, more experimental, more collaborative. We need a staff room where everybody feels safe to be imaginative, to be experimental, to ask for help, to be a learner. To ask for more, uh, learn from our mistakes. Too. Exactly, exactly. And then if we, if the teachers in a school have that attitude, then it's contagious. 
then the, like influenza, then the kids will pick it up. If we're behaving that way, then they'll get it. And if the children are behaving that way, then their parents will get it. It looks like an easy thing, as you are explaining it, but sometimes, as an educator, I think that it's, it's more difficult than it looks at first time. Yes. So, how, which advice would you give us, educators, to a person learners uh, and a student, <laughs> to do not give up? It's clear what's, what is needed, and it's quite easy to articulate many of the things that need to shift. But if you're a teacher in a busy school, you have to just take little things. Just change your practice, change your language, change the way you comment on students' work. But don't try and do it all at once. Just take small things, even what we've discovered, even just a little thing, like changing the way you use erasers in the classroom. Just a little thing like that, talking about the function of erasers and raising the children's consciousness, the students' consciousness about the fact that it's not a bad thing to make mistakes. If they get that idea, then the erasers are perfectly okay. But if they feel that they're frightened of making mistakes, so they have to immediately remove the shameful evidence of the fact that they didn't get it right first time, then that's not a good thing. Then we need to say, well, maybe we're all going to do without the erasers for a month and celebrate our rough work, celebrate our mistakes, so we get used, get used to it. So start with small things, and then just gradually, over a year or two, build them up, Great. little bit by little bit.